Let's get started. Is that too loud? Is the sound okay or is it too loud? Good, okay. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started since we have a tag team this afternoon for this medication management session. My name is Oralia Basaldu. I'm a clinical pharmacist, uh, academician with the Health Science Center. I'm a faculty at the Family Medicine um, Department. And I do have a couple of clinics where I see patients, the pharmacotherapy clinic, anticoagulation clinic, and I teach uh, medical residents and medical students and whoever else wants to learn about medication use and, and most importantly, patients. And so what we'd like to share with you today, I will be the high touch part of the presentation and Duane will be the high tech and Dr. Ratner will have some closing remarks. So our objectives uh, for today are to describe the evidence of how health literacy affects medication use. And if you were here this morning, Dr. Davis actually took all my slides and discussed them. So what I will do is actually uh, do some discussion so that you can tell me what would be on those slides in terms of how health literacy affects medication use. And then, that's it. Let me pull it. And then what I will do is just share with you some practical experience, maybe some skills that you can actually use. I think some of you may already know about these, but hopefully you can learn a few tips uh, from us this afternoon. Then Dwayne will talk about some high-tech skills and websites, and then we'll finish up with Dr. Ratner. So let me go ahead and get started here with a, a short little video. We've also known, noticed that there's a high number of patients who get admitted for things that they wouldn't need to be admitted for if we had a better handle on all of their medical issues. We've increased dosages on patients that were not compliant or adherent to their medications. And then inadvertently, we had overdoses when they finally did take their medications. Approximately one and a half million people are injured each year due to the incorrect usage of or lack of access to medications. And nearly 25% of ambulatory patients experience some type of adverse drug event. The Institute of Medicine has stated that the safety and quality risk associated with medication use in the United States is severe. Putting aside the toll of this issue on human life, the IOM has declared that for every dollar spent on ambulatory medications, another dollar is spent to treat new health problems caused by these medications. Ineffectiveness of our systems of care has been identified as one of the primary factors contributing to these unfortunate outcomes. So before I go on, I want to hear from you what do you learned from Dr. Davis this morning about how health literacy might affect medication use, or perhaps you can share an experience you've had in your practice about how patients misunderstand their medications or uh, have medication errors, so that we can all share about our experiences. Anybody want to go first? I have lots of them, but I don't want to be the one. You know, I share with patients who are illiterate, but yet they're going to get a bottle with words on it, and how do you translate that into So they they don't know how to read and then they get writing on the medication labels and then so how do you translate that before they leave? Yeah, so one of the things we've done is you know done sort of like a picture, can everybody hear? Done a picture diagram like right on their checkout sheet a picture of it's the medicine that starts with this letter or these two letters you know and then um, you know like a picture of the sun coming up a picture so of pictograms the and, but doing it by hand you don't have any kind of hand up. Okay, so hopefully we'll, we can share some, some websites that might be useful. So she says they actually try to do some of that uh, education before the patient leaves. Anybody else? Either concerns, experiences you've had? Yes? As you're talking, I have this idea that I never had before, but everyone that has iPhones that you can record, you can just video record them. <laughs> <laughs> if I was fast enough to get it going, I yeah. 
Uh, you had. I just have a little personal anecdote, which is that my daughter is very small. She never, when she was born, she was never on any of the charts for weight or height. So when I went to get her at some point from Tylenol, her, her weight level <laughs> wasn't on there, and so I didn't. I'm I'm literate. I you know I, I know what I'm doing. I didn't know what to do. Yes, we'll talk about that a little bit. So she's talking about the weight base or age based dosing that you find in the over the counter Tylenol or ibuprofen. And some patients, like in her case, she's too small, so she was off the charts in the too small side. And a lot of times we see the opposite where they're off the charts and the kid's too big, but they're only one year old. So, what do you do in terms of which dose do you choose? Good point. Anybody else? Any errors? <coughs> Your resources. Okay. So good. Thanks for your comment. Anybody else want to comment on maybe why this is important for why you're here? Apparently you have an interest. We'll go with you and then one last comment. Good point. So find out what they're taking first and avoid drug interactions. I work in an anticoagulation clinic. I was there Tuesday and probably in the many years I've been there, it's probably the worst patient I've had. And he had three drugs that interacted with Coumadin and he's lucky that he actually didn't end up in the hospital with some bleeding. Um, and one more, more comment. overwhelming and this is with family members like yourself that is educated can you imagine those that don't have that support there are some seats up here please feel free to come up here all right so I'm going to share with you I think some of the the things that we talked about and Dr. Davis talked about this morning what does the literature say and how they relate medication use and health literacy so first considering what does the patient really need to actually manage their medication as well just a few thoughts one, know how to read first, okay. What else? The, the right language. They need to know math, like Dr. Davis say, just, you know, calculating, adding, figuring out a chart. They have to be able to understand it, because I was talking to somebody from NHMR about, we were talking about medication labels, and, that, you know, what should be on there, what shouldn't, and she said with her patients, it needs to say by mouth, because they might take it some other way. Yes, it should say by mouth, and, and I see this all the time in, in children's medications. So they go and see the doctor for an ear infection, and they get amoxicillin syrup, which is supposed to be taken by mouth, but they went in for an ear infection, so they put it in the ear. So you can go on and on about those different stories. Um, so these are a list of the things that they need. So they need to be able to read the labels, uh, read the dosing instructions. Just listen to the explanation. If we actually take the time to explain to them, just be able to listen to what uh, the provider is saying. Um, talking again, someone mentioned that the doctors are so busy. So how does the patient actually uh, feel confident enough to interrupt the doctor and say, I don't understand what you're saying because the doctor is busy and moving on to the next patient. Uh, they need to ask, we ask the, our diabetic patients to check their sugars and write them down or write their food logs. So they need to be able to do that to manage their medications. And the example that you're talking about your CHF family member, that's very common with lots of medications, lots of medical problems. Just keeping up with appointments with heart specialists, the family doctor, the dietitian. There's so many things to keep up with. And then, then Kathy talked about calculations and knowing some math. How do I calculate uh, this measured dose or how many do I take? So lots of all these skills we are requiring our patients to have to actually manage their medications.
So I'm going to go just kind of run through, this is going to be quick because Dr. Davis touched on this and we can have more time for uh, discussion. So how, what does the research say in terms of how it affects or um, is related to health literacy? <coughs> Excuse me, so knowledge. So just understanding the labels you saw in the video that the older lady came in driving, but the label said do not drive when you're taking this medication. So just understanding the auxiliary labels on there, they have trouble. In one study, they found that 65% of the patients that were studied were not reading those appropriately. And how many pills to take? So take two twice a day. It's hard for patients to understand. Is it okay if I take it at 8 o'clock in the morning and then at 10 o'clock in the morning? That's twice a day, right? You think it makes sense, but some patients may have a hard time understanding that. Also, how many refills are left? And we'll talk a little bit about reading medication labels, but a lot of patients don't realize that how many refills are left is actually in their label. And <clears throat> at least in our clinic, they spend time driving into the clinic and asking for a refill when they don't really need to. So three to four times misinterpreting auxiliary labels. So many, uh, many issues with this. First of all, as we get older, you probably cannot even see it. So much less um, understand it. And what Kathy was saying about reading a chart that has uh, weight and age and then you need to figure it out. I learned this early on that some patients don't know about the X and Y axis to actually figure out what the answer is. <coughs> Excuse me. So decreased medication management. How many of you take care of asthmatic patients or talk to asthmatic patients? A good number. So there was a study in CHESS a few years ago, but basically what they found is that patients that had limited health literacy didn't know how to use their asthma inhaler. Even the patients that had higher health literacy didn't know, uh, but they were at least a little bit better. And I'm sure, does anybody have any stories on patients using their asthma inhaler incorrectly? I've had Dr. Weaver, no? <laughs> she can go on and on, I'm sure. Uh, but actually, I'm gonna show you one that I thought was interesting. Maybe you've seen it on TV already. Sometimes doctors make mistakes. Anna, you need to try twice as hard to fix them. Are you using your inhaler? All the time. Go through one a week. You sure you're using it right? Do I look like an idiot? No. Nope. Why don't you show me how your inhaler works? That's funny, but it's really not funny because it does happen, uh, unfortunately. And I've seen patients using it backwards, so they just spray it and then just go like this, and so different ways. But I don't mean to demean it because it's important that patients actually understand all their medications, especially their asthma medications that can be um, life or death situations. So. But I just kind of wanted to emphasize how really the, how big the problem is. So this is what Dr. Davis was talking about this morning, and she was actually the lead author on this, on this article that found that the patients can tell you, I'm going to take two tablets twice a day of this medication. But when you ask them, okay, show me how you're going to take it. And they can't figure out that it's two in the morning and two in the evening. You know, they say three or just take one twice a day. And until her study, I didn't realize that problem. And so I think we really need to, again, emphasize the proper use of medications because as you saw in the beginning video, there are lots of medication errors and readmissions again happen because of that. And we were talking about <coughs> take backs um, that our water system has here, San Antonio water system. And I don't remember how many, do you remember Dwayne, how many pounds of medications that were actually taken back? There were times actually of medications that were being uh, taken back from the, from the water system. But the first thing that came to my mind is all those patients that didn't get their antibiotics or the medications that they really needed, uh, not to mention the cost. So this study also showed that patients, if they went into the emergency room, I know some people work in emergency centers, and you ask the patient, tell me what medications you're taking, or be able to identify their medications, they cannot. So. Um, Again, the higher health literacy had a 68% of actually identifying their medicines, 
but ideally we want 100. Okay, so patients that had lower limited health literacy were less likely to be able to identify their medications. Uh, and this study is 10 to 18 times the odds of being unable to identify them. Just having them there in front of them already. And I've, I get patients all the time, they bring other medications and so then I ask them, uh, tell me how you're taking this medication and they cannot tell me. Uh, one, because another family member perhaps is helping them. That would be the best ideal situation. So how does it relate to adherence? Because ultimately that's really what we're interested in is uh, the patient taking it so that it can improve their outcomes and hopefully improve morbidity and mortality. So the, the answer is still yet to be determined. There are a number of studies. Uh, the first three studies say that health literacy actually decreases adherence. There's another, st another study that says it actually increases and a few other studies that say there is no effect. So in terms of adherence, I tend to believe myself that there is actually a decrease um, in adherence in terms of relation to health literacy. But when you look at, look at the literature, it's not as straightforward. So how many of you have patients that have difficulty paying for their medications? And so what do they do to try and get away? Take it every other day. I saw someone splitting it in half. Did not take it, right? So this is actually interesting. I got called uh, about a month or two ago from uh, a radio station because they wanted to ask me about this new report that came out in Consumer Reports. And basically what they found is that patients were actually cutting corners to actually uh, take their medications because they couldn't pay for them. And <clears throat> one of the things that they wanted to emphasize is that it has been getting worse since the new economic downfall that we've had recently. So this is kind of one slide that I, I picked from here. So the orange and dark orange are patients that actually have prescription benefit. So as you can see, it hasn't really affected them too much. The blue patients are the ones that uh, have no prescription benefit. And again, what they were trying to do is uh, contrast 2011, which is the darker blue, versus 200, 2012. And as you can see, the first one says, 45% of the patients studied or surveyed skipped filling a prescription because of cost. And we see this all the time from the emergency room or being discharged. We had a patient that went into the emergency room for pain in his knee, had an emergency visit. And then I saw him two days later, and I was doing a medication reconciliation, asking him about his pain. And he says, well, I still have pain and I have the prescription because I couldn't fill it. So that goes on all the time. The second part is talking about how many patients skipped a scheduled dose without really talking to a doctor or pharmacist. So that was 31% uh, this year. And like Raquel was talking about, some patients cut their pill in half because at least a little bit is better than nothing, right? So 19% um, cut their pills in half, at least of those that were surveyed. Okay, so what do we do about it? Now that we know it's a problem, not that we didn't before, but just to reemphasize it. Any thoughts? So I think it's up to us to come up with a solution. Our patients aren't going to do that. So it's up to us, yes. So in, in, um, in keeping with time, I just want to run through a few thoughts of my own. Um, and again, I think some of this you already know, but I like to just emphasize a few points. And that's just a summary of what I'll be talking about. So your patients have all these medications, right? So the first thing someone mentioned is, what are the patients taking? Because to me, that's the very first step, and I teach my students, medication reconciliation is vitally important when they come into the emergency room, to the clinic, because if you don't know what they're taking, then how can you go to the next step? And so, so these are the general questions. So first, get a list from their medical record if you can uh, get them. Then ask them if they have their current medication bottles with them because a lot of times they know better by seeing the, patient, the medication bottle in front of them. And then who is the person responsible for taking their medications? That's a vitally important uh, part of the, of the history because if it's their wife or their spouse and they're not here, then you're not going to get an accurate uh, record from that patient. So that's important. Um, how many different doctors prescribe medications for you? Which pharmacies do you prefer? So we have patients that, again, to cut costs, they go to Walmart because it costs $4 there, and they use our hospital system because they can get it free there. 
And so as a result, you have patients going to different pharmacies, and so there's no opportunity to catch drug interactions. So I won't go through all of this, but a complete medication history <clears throat> is important. Um, not just prescriptions, but over the counters, herbal products. I ask them, do you bring medications from other countries like Canada or Mexico? We did a survey a few years ago uh, in the flea markets and asked them if they find prescription products there, specifically antibiotics, and about 14% said yes. And so you can imagine how that increases the likelihood of resistance in our population. Um, and then adherence is very important. There is no good gold standard to measure adherence, and the Morisky scale is the closest one. What I do is kind of a pain scale, zero to 10. Uh, so I ask them on a scale of zero to 10, how, how good are you at taking your medications every day? 10, you don't miss any, and zero is you never take them. And we did a, uh, a short try to validation, uh, try to validate uh, study last summer, so I'm still evaluating that data to see how well that works. Um, so anyways, medication history is important, uh, as well as the allergies and so this is just an example of a medication list in case you're not familiar with any. But safemedication.com, you can get just, again, this one has some nice pictures. You just make sure the patients are able to understand and read it. Uh, this is one of my favorites. It's called uh, mymedschedule.com, and it's from medactionplan.com. And I know I've been using it for years, and it's been a free service or a free website, uh, but I think Either they have or they will surely start charging for it. So they hooked us in and now they're going to charge us. But it's a very good schedule because it actually has a picture. So if it's a brand product, if it's a generic, it'll just have a generic uh, uh, white picture. But it actually tells them exactly when to take them and how many to take. So I like that, um, that format. How to read labels. We just went over this with our promotoras in our clinic. And again, what I wanted to emphasize is that Patients should know that they have a number of refills here so that they can uh, avoid a trip to the hospital or the clinic when they don't have transportation. Uh, the other thing that a lot of people don't know is that prescriptions are good for a year. So, however, if, the, if they have refills, like six refills, and the year is already expired, then the whole prescription is expired, even though they have refills. Um, so teaching that, and then over-the-counter labels is also important to read, uh, specifically to avoid toxicity. So a lot of patients don't realize that Tylenol and acetaminophen are the same thing. So if a patient has the flu and they use NyQuil, and then they have a headache and they go to pick some Tylenol or Excedrin, then they get overdoses on Tylenol or whatever ingredient there. So teaching them about the active ingredients there is important. Um, consolidating pharmacies is another good point to to try and do because again that'll um, minimize the medication errors, catch drug interactions. And then I think maybe you were alluding to that also about a patient with CHF. I see patients that take medications almost every three hours and because they think it's not good to take them all at once but what ends up happening is they don't take them at all or they miss them. And so, um, so what I try to do is I uh, want to make sure that it's appropriate to combine them, but at least simplify it and just say, okay, you just have to take them twice a day. You don't have to separate them by these many hours. And they're just like so relieved because, you know, it'll make their life easier. Okay, so a few uh, money-saving techniques. So first of all, the patient should really communicate with their provider that they are not ha being able to uh, buy the medication or pay for it so that the provider can at least try and help them as much as they can. Of course, generics, I always get the question, is the, are the generics really just as good as the brand? And for the most part, the answer is yes. Um, if you have a copay, for example, if I have a $10 copay and I have, uh, I'm taking lisinopril, so I pay $10 for that, and I'm taking hydrochlorothiazide, so I pay $10 for that. So ideally, if you can combine it in a product that has both lisinopril and hydrochlorothiazide, then you just have one copay. Yes, Dr. Weaver. Yeah, so sometimes yeah, I pay $10 for my copay, but I can go get it at Walmart for $4, and that happens. But again, that just kind of more, poly, not polypharmacy, but more pharmacies uh, getting into the picture, but they have to do what they have to do. Um, so the other thing is sometimes 
uh, drug companies are sneaky because, again, if uh, the, the patent for lisinopril is, is over, then what they do is they combine it with another drug like hydrochlorothiazide or whatever drug. And so now this combination now has a new patent. And so that causes that brand product to be more expensive. So what you can do is actually uh, give the generic of this one and generic of this one and it's less expensive. So depending on what the situation is, either combining them or separating them might save money. <clears throat> and I'm running out of time here. Um, of course, diabetes. Uh, hypertension, dyslipidemia, I tell the patients all the time, with lifestyle modifications, weight loss, you can avoid adding another medication. Um, so sometimes mail order is also cheaper if you, can, uh, if you have that in your plan, so I uh, try to encourage that for our patients. And Medicaid, I just wanted to briefly, before I run out of time here, to help our Medicaid patients. So some programs are different, but most of the time Medicaid pays for three medications for most adults. And so patients that are taking six, nine medications, that might be trouble. But one of the things that people don't know is that they will pay for a 90-day supply. So in this example, for example, they'll get drug number one, drug number two, and number three in January. And in February, they're going to have to get the same drugs, number one, number two, and number three for 30 days. But they do allow a 90-day supply. <coughs> So what we can teach the patients to do is actually stagger them. So on January, they can get drug number one, drug number two, and drug number three, but for 90 days. So the next time they have to fill it, it's not until April. So now in February, they can get drug number five, drug number four, five, and six, okay? And then that doesn't have to be filled until May. So theoretically, they can get up to nine medications with this program. So this is sometimes uh, something that they don't know. The downfall is that it's complicated, a lot of, you know, coordinating, so uh, you might, and so we need to figure out how to make it easier for them. Um, this is just a study where they actually get medications free and they were trying to find out whether this actually helped adherence. And it helped a little bit, but that was not the whole answer, so there's a lot more to adherence than just paying for the medications. Um, visual tool that I use for our diabetic, hypertensive um, lipid patients is like a traffic light system. So I show them because it's asymptomatic that if their A1C is greater than seven, they're in the red, means high risk. So just uh, showing them a visual tool helps to understand the situation. Teach back, I won't go too much on this, but I'm a big fan of teach back when educating patients. And uh, let's see, I just wanted to share one more thing here is an idea that because this is such a, a passion of mine and such a big need in our, not just our city, our state, but nationwide, is I was, um, had the idea after watching a Dave Ramsey program. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that. Raise your hand. So what he does is actually it's a financial literacy video kit. And so he teaches patients about, or people like me, how to uh, be better with their finances. So I got the idea is to develop a video kit on how to improve medication literacy for our population. So for example, one video would be um, how to read labels over the counter and prescription, um, how to keep track of their medications in the list. Um, the savvy OTC customer would be another video. The next one would be uh, just simple savings like I just ran through right now. Uh, how to make the smartest trip to the pharmacy when you go. Uh, websites and, and helpful tools. Uh, another one are natural medicines and websites that, and uh, sorry, the FDA inside that would be useful. So anyway, so um, so we actually wrote a grant and we did, we're not successful the first time, but I think it's very important that I'm going to keep on trying different avenues to see how we can get this through. And once we get this, uh, the idea is to actually have trained the trainers. So the videos will be supplements and someone would be actually helping just teach the population just these simple tips about reading the prescriptions, how to save money, how to avoid drug interactions. And I know I went to a lot, but I wanted to just kind of give a general overview and I'm gonna scoot it over to Duane and hopefully have some time for questions at the end. Um, we're actually, while we're switching microphones, anybody have a quick question or comment?
tools out there that might be helpful. Uh, the first two are actually some formulary uh, um, tools that are out there. So if you have a patient that you know, you're not sure if the medication is on their, on their insurance formulary or if it's on a port off list somewhere, this is a really nice tool. It's called Fingertip Formulary. And when you go there, uh, you pick the state that you're in, and you can just take the health plans that are out there. So if you know your patient's health plan, select that, and you select the drug, it'll tell you exactly what tier of medication um, that is for them. And you can find alternatives. Like I said, it also has the $4 plans, it has all the Medicare plans. So I find this one, I use this one in the clinic quite a bit too. Destination RX is very similar. There's also some other health information that goes along with that. And then tools of clinicians, you know, if you need to look up drug, drug interactions or need to know more about medicines, there's a couple out there that are free. I would um, advocate Micromedics. It's more one that we use as, as pharmacists. Can everybody hear me okay? My wife says I mumble, so. I want to thank you all. Um, the first part of this presentation talks about how we can improve compliance. What about the other side of the spectrum? What if you have a patient who's perfectly compliant? Perfectly compliant and taking 25 or 30 medications. Anyone have patients like that? Well, let me tell you a story. I'm a radiologist, so I'm a picture doctor, for those of you who don't know what a radiologist is. I don't routinely have patients come into my office and see me and, and I write prescriptions for them. I don't do that. Several years ago, I started getting phone calls.